as I'm the first presenter, I need to present myself. I'm Dr. Luisa Bonin. I have been working at UG Enter at six years. I'm a material scientist. Uh, I did my PhD on electrochemistry and I migrated to environmental electrochemistry in my postdoc. That's what I do for the last six years. So let's talk about electrochemistry. So I said that you could ask questions when you want, but I also will do a lot of questions. So my first question to you is, what is electrochemistry? What, what comes to your mind when I, when I say, let's talk about electrochemistry? And I would guess all of you are able to say it's something related to chemistry and electricity. Cannot see another thing. If this calls electrochemistry, needs to be electricity and chemistry. And I'd say you are all correct. Electrochemistry, simply saying, is the relationship between chemical reactions and electricity. But we could divide this in two different sentences. That's, I would like that you remember. And because of this, I repeat these two sentences a lot of times in this presentation. Electrochemistry can be chemical reactions that can create electricity. So you have a chemical reactions like inside of a battery and this creates electricity. Or in the other side, can be the use of electricity to make certain chemical reactions happen that wouldn't happen otherwise. So you would like to have this reaction happening. This is not spontaneous. This would not happen. And what you do, you use electrochemistry to force it, and then you have this reaction happening. So you have the influence of chemistry in electricity, and you have the influence of electricity in chemistry. Basically, is what electrochemistry is about. I know this is super general. So let's start talking about what is electricity. I think this is even more simple and common for you, but if I can simplify this for you, I would say electricity is the movement of electrons. So if you have if you have electrons moving from one side to the other, you have electricity. So this is this is clear thing. And then how this would work in a chemical reaction. So we have an example here. So if you have an oxidation reduction reaction, for example, what happens is that element A can give electrons to element B. So we have movement of electrons, so we have electricity. So we have a chemical reaction that generates electricity. So let's try to make it a bit more daily applications. So I said to you that if we have element A, element B, a can give electrons to element B, and that this creates a movement of electrons. So this creates electricity. So what happens if I put a wire between A and B? I will have electrons movement in this wire. So I can say that I have electricity, and I could put a lamp here, and then I could put this lamp on, so I have electricity. So it's clear here that chemical reactions can create electricity. But how electricity can make certain chemical reactions happen that wouldn't happen otherwise? So if I do the same, but now I connect element C with element D, and this is not thermodynamically favorable, C would normally not send electrons to D. Then I use electricity. I put a battery here in the middle, and the battery is able to pull electrons from C and send these electrons to D. So now I am creating some chemical reactions using electricity. That would not happen. So C is not more C and D is not more D. They, are, they have one electron less and one electron more because we use electricity. So let's be even more clear and even more practical. 
what happens when I connect a piece of zinc with a piece of copper? So I put both inside of liquid that we normally call electrolytes, and then I connect this with a wire, wire and I put a lamp. Will this lamp cut on? So, would zinc send electrons to copper? Would copper send electrons to zinc? You probably don't know just like this, but this is the most simple and common battery, the battery of the 20s. So, what happened is that zinc has a weaker pull for electrons when compared to copper, and zinc loses electrons to copper. So, zinc will send electrons to copper. Copper has a stronger pull to electrons, so copper will take these electrons. And copper to plus gains the electrons. So what happens in this cell is that zinc sends electrons to copper, and this creates electricity because this creates a movement of these electrons. And this movement puts the lamp on. So just some important words here that you will hear a lot with my colleagues. Zinc loses electrons. So zinc gets oxidized. And copper gains electrons. So we say that copper is reduced. So these are the two most com common electrochemical reactions. The oxidation, that's the loss of electrons, and the reduction. That's the gain of electrons. And this reaction between copper and zinc happens on its own. It's a spontaneous reaction. So, a curious and natural question that could come now is, but how you know? How you know that this would happen? How you know zinc would be giving electrons and copper would be receiving these electrons. It's easy to know for zinc and copper because this is a battery that we know and exists, but how we know for other elements? And then for that, we can use this table. That's the redox potential table. I'm not expecting that you learn this by heart. Even myself, I don't know. I always use the table if I need. But the idea is that this table gives us the redox potential for each different reaction. And if we look here, we'll see that copper 2 plus will have two electrons and become copper with a potential of 0 to 4 volts. And if we want to do the same with zinc, Zinc 2 plus would pull two electrons to become zinc with a less 0 0.76. So, as high the element is in this table, big is the probability that this element takes the electrons. And as low this element is in the table, big is the probability that this is the element that gives the electrons. So, as copper is here and zinc is here, I can always say that copper will pull the electrons and zinc will give the electrons. So is why zinc loses electrons, it's oxidized, and copper gain electrons, it's reduced. So now that you know this table, I could ask you what happened if I do a different connection? I don't connect zinc with copper, but in this time, I connect zinc with magnesium. So what would happen? Who will give electrons to who? What's the expected reaction? You have the zinc, I have the magnesium, I have these electrons. What's the way that this electron will do? We look at the table, we see that zinc is in the top. So has a stronger pull for electrons than magnesium. So we can expect that 
magnesium has a weaker pull for electrons and magnesium will lose electrons. But zinc that has a stronger pull for electrons will gain these electrons. So this time is magnesium that gives electrons to zinc. And it's like this that this will work. So this is interesting to know, not just to create batteries, but also because we can also use this to protect elements from corrosion. You see, this is a piece of zinc and this is a piece of magnesium. So if we want to protect, for example, some zinc piece, we could connect a piece, a sacrificial piece of magnesium to it, and we know will be corroding, oxidizing, losing electrons is magnesium and zinc will be protected. So if you look at the table also, you see that lithium has a really special place here. You see that there is a good tendency to give electrons. And you probably understand that this is why lithium is so good for batteries. He's not, he, he has really not a pull to take electrons from others. And is always giving these electrons. So, put lithium in a really good position for batteries. It's not the idea today to talk about batteries, but I, I just thought it was a good uh, curiosity for you. So, if if we come back to the zinc copper um, electrochemical cell, I would like to introduce to you some new words that you also hear from my colleagues. Now that you know, if I have a piece of zinc and a piece of copper and I connect them, zinc would be giving electrons to copper. I can introduce you some other words. For example, I was calling this piece of zinc and piece of copper, but the electrochemical word for this is electrode. So you see my colleagues talking about an electrode. So we use an electrode to do the reaction. These are simply the elements where the reactions are happy, happening, the electrodes. Also, we have special names for the electrode that give the electrons and the electrode that receive the electrons. And these names are cathode and anode. So I'm not expecting you to remember all these words. But I'm just remembering you these words because you're here today. So the anode is where the oxidation happens. So the anode here is the zinc, is the oxidized element, is the one that loses electrons. And the cathode is where the reduction happens. So in our case, the cathode is the copper. So now you know we have anode and we have a cathode. And you probably saw that our electrodes have changed a bit the format also, because this is something that I also would like to open your eyes. When we start to have oxidation and we start to give electrons, zinc's not more zinc. Zinc becomes zinc two plus. And zinc two plus is not a metal, but it's a soluble element. So zinc two plus go to the liquid and zinc starts to lose part of this material. That's what we call corrosion or oxidation. So we start to have a degradation of the, the anode. From the other side, in the cathode, we are having new electrons coming. Where does electrons would go? If you have other elements, several reactions could happen. But if you have copper two plus, in the solution, this copper to plus will become copper and will deposit in the surface of copper. So this is the method that is used for electro deposition. You probably already hear about, or if you don't hear about, you have see, for example, jewelries that are not pure gold. It's just a metal with a gold layer on it. So it's how this is done. You can have some gold, Two plus that with some new electrons become gold and go to the electrode surface, to the cathode surface. So this is how the position happens. So just remembering the concept, we have the oxidation and the reduction. 
the oxidation is where you lose electrons, and the reduction is where you gain electrons. So, and the oxidation happens in the anode, and the reduction happens in the cathode. If you want to remember, the two vials are together, anode oxidation and the two consonants, cathode reduction. You can create different methods or you can just take a note. But what I show you until now is how chemistry can create electricity. Let's try to do the opposite now. Let's talk about how electricity can make some chemical reactions happen that would not happen otherwise. Let's talk about electrolysis. I'm almost sure you already hear people talking about water electrolysis. If you didn't hear these exact words, you probably hear about the use of hydrogen as a source of energy and that the future is hydrogen, that we could use this as a source of energy. So the most common method to create this hydrogen is electrolysis because you don't need chemicals. You just need water and energy. And how energy is able to create hydrogen from water? So if I just show this reaction for you, I think it's intuitive to say that this is a reaction that would not happen spontaneously. Because if it was spontaneous, we would not live in a planet that there is water everywhere. We would be living in a planet that there is hydrogen and oxygen gas everywhere. And we don't find hydrogen like this. So if I want to have this reaction happening, I need to force it. And how I force it? I use electricity. So we, we already talked about oxidation and reduction. So just to show you how this is not intuitive, I will show you some numbers. So what's happening here? The hydrogen that's normally charged as a plus because hydrogen normally just lose electrons easily, is here gaining electrons and becoming hydrogen zero. And oxygen, that's a good oxidizing agent, is being oxidized. So we have the last two that become zero. So what we have here is that oxygen loses electrons and is oxidized. If we go back to the table, and not put the whole table here, but we see that the tendency would be that oxygen take the electrons and hydrogen lose the electrons. So this reaction is not thermodynamically favorable. This would never happen. However, when we put electricity here, we can inverse facts because naturally oxygen has a stronger pull for electrons and hydrogen has a weaker pull for electrons. But what we do is that we make oxygen send electrons to hydrogen. Why? How? Because we use electricity. So this is how electrolysis work. We take a reaction that doesn't happen on its own, that's not spontaneous, and we use a battery or any other source of power, and we pull the electrons from oxygen and push them to hydrogen. So, this is what would happen. And in this case, we use two electrodes, cathode and anode, that are just a carbon source. They just need to be conductive because the reactions are happening in the liquid. We, the reactions are not happening in the electrodes. So a battery can pull the electrons from oxygen and push them to hydrogen. So we, if we come back to our initial sentence, Electricity can make certain chemical reactions happen that wouldn't happen otherwise. To summarize what happens in electrolysis, 
is that electrons are pulled from oxygen and oxygen is oxidized in the anodes. And in the other side, we have the electrons pushed to hydrogen and hydrogen is reduced. And so we have this happening in the cathode. So, to summarize the basis of electrochemistry, I will come back to two initial sentences. Electrochemistry is when you have chemical reactions creating electricity or electricity making chemical reactions that normally doesn't happen, happening. So, you can have a chemical reaction like the element A that give electrons to element B, in the case of zinc, that naturally gives electrons to copper. And then if we connect, we have the generation of electricity because we have the movement of electrons here. Or in the other side, you can electricity that makes certain chemical reactions happen. So if we say that C and D, for example, are oxygen and hydrogen, we can use a battery to take electrons from oxygen and push them to hydrogen. And it's how the energy can be used to make water become hydrogen and oxygen. So these were general electrochemistry. Now that you know this, I would like to show you three examples, just to be a bit more clear and fun and also something that you can remember. I will start with the one that I think is the first contact everyone has with electrochemistry, electrodeposition or electroplating. This is a process where we use method really close to electrolysis, but that you can use that you can plate a metal in the surface of another. So, like I said, in the jewelry or here in the example in the spoon. So when you have a silver spoon, normally this is not pure silver. This is a stainless steel spoon that has a layer of silver. How this is done? We connect a piece of silver, let's call it the anode, to a stainless steel spoon, let's call it the cathode. And then we put a battery here. So we force silver to be oxidized. We force electrons to do this way. And then when they are in contact with the cathode, that is the silver spoon, and also with a solution with a lot of silver plus, we have the reduction of the silver plus to silver zero. So we have the plating in this spoon. So what happens, we take a piece of silver and a spoon that there is no silver and we force the electrons going this way. As there's a lot of silver plus in the electrolyte in the solution, they start to deposit in the surface of the spoon. And this is how jewelry can be done also and, and, and other things that are shiny metallic with copper, nickel, uh, gold, chromium plating, it's all electrochemistry. So this is also used for metal recovery because you may not have this piece of metal here, but you have a lot of, met a lot of elements, ions, like the silver in the surface, and we could recover them, plating them in the surface of a metal. The second method that I would like to give you as an example is capacitive deionization. I will really just talk fast here because you have just after me, Adrian, talking about this. So you have all the details. But this is really interesting because it's an electrochemical method that we use for clean water, for example. Did you already ask yourself how we could take out the salt of the ocean and have clean water to drink. So CDI is an answer for it. In this case, we have two porous electrodes 
and we polarize them in a way that they are not losing or receiving electrons. They are just being with the surface electrochemically active. So the anode in the case is positive polarized. So there's some positive charge in the surface. And the cathode is negatively charged. So what happens is when the anode is positively charged, he attracts all the negative charge. So in the case of the seawater, all the chlorine comes to this porous electrode. And in the case of seawater, all the sodium will come to the cathode. So if you send some seawater here, the anions go to one side, the cations go to the other because of this electrochemical polarization. And in the end, you have the salinated water. So this is also one application of electrochemistry. A bit more complex, my third example is membrane electrolysis. You have also a whole presentation on it. But what I just would like to introduce here is that in the case of membrane electrolysis, we have this reduction and oxidation of water happening in the end and in the cathode. But we also use membranes. And these membranes are able to choose if cations or anions will cross. So for example, here we have AEM, that stands for anion exchange membrane. And we have CEM, that stands for cation exchange membrane. What this means is that just anions will cross this one and just cations will cross this one. So this is the interesting part of membrane electrolysis. You can really use several membranes if you want. And with this, you do separations. And your sodium sulfate, for example, here, could become sodium hydroxide and sulfuric acid. So these are the examples that I would like to show uh, for you. And with this, I will also finalize my presentation. You have all my contacts here in this last slide. And I am open to questions if you have. If not, also in the end, I'll be here. I hope now is a bit more clear for you what electrochemistry is about. Um, and that you are ready to discover and hear the other presentations that will come. So if someone has a question, please raise the hand. Uh, if not, uh, I'll wait like two minutes and then we'll follow with Adrian presentation. So I, I didn't say it, but we will have a break after Adrian presentation and then we have a second section. So if you have question, please. No, I saw that just Magdalena asked if you could record the webinar. For sure, Magdalena. Sorry that I didn't. Yes, I just want to thank you, Luisa, for very clear, very clear explanation of electrochemical methods. So now for me as a geoscientist, but not familiar with, with this, is everything is clear. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. As I said, the objective is not that you learn all the concepts, but if one day you, as geologists, you see a source of water with metals and you can say, oh, maybe electrochemistry could help us. Let, let's try, let's think about this. It's yeah. also what our colleagues will show in the next presentations, the methods and, and how we can use these methods to, to give you ideas in the future when you find the rich source of, of metals. <laughs>